glad you're here. Um, thanks for joining me and uh, start with introducing our panelist, Tatiana Filevska, who is the creative director at Ukrainian Institute. Uh, she's an art manager and curator. She has a background in philosophy, specializes in 20th century Ukrainian art, especially Kazimir Malevich. Um, Claire de Brekela, regional arts director of the British Council. Um, she led the development of the UK-Ukraine season of culture, 2022-2023, that we're going to be talking about. Um, and manages a portfolio of 15 countries within the British Council um, Europe region. And Martin Green, uh, Managing Director of Eurovision Song Contest 2023 uh, from the BBC. 20 plus years of experience <laughs> in managing major events, uh, including um, being the head of ceremonies for London 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Thanks all for coming. Um, and um, before we start, I just wanted to um, introduce the two events that we're, that we're talking about, the UK-Ukraine cultural partnership um, um, really sort of um, comes to the fore. Uh, the Season of Culture, organized by the Ukrainian Institute and uh, the British Council, which has been running since April last year um, and finishes in March, uh, this, this month, in March 2023. It was a series of events and projects in visual arts, music, film, literature, theater, uh, happening all in the UK and online, not in Ukraine. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about, um, obviously, how, how all of that happened uh, and uh, how the program had to be adjusted because of the um, Russian invasion. Uh, and then the other point uh, that we're discussing is the uh, Eurovision Song Contest, um, which, is, which is going to be happening the second week of May with the grand finale on the 13th, on the Saturday, um, in Liverpool. Um, so just to start with an introduction to the season, tell us more about, um, if you could tell us a bit more um, about that, Claire. Um, what has the season been about? Um, what, are, what were the highlights in terms of the projects and, and events that were happening? Um, and what has been the reception so far? Um, hi, everyone. So, I mean, the origins, I guess, to start with, the origins of the season were all the way back in 2019. We were talking about the importance of doing a UK-Ukraine season, Originally, we were looking at celebrating 30 years of diplomatic history between the two nations, um, a, a joint shared sense of, of um, identity and partnership. And obviously, um, you know, we were at the very last stages of planning the season um, in, the, in you know, February of last year. Uh, we were due to start in May, I think. Uh, we were going to do a bilateral program, a UK program in Ukraine, a Ukraine program in UK working together, Ukrainian Institute and, and British Council, all of which had to be pivoted and changed. Um, so, I mean, we'll, I, Tatiana, we'll talk a little bit more, I think, about uh, the details of what we've delivered here. But in the end, we've had to uh, take the opportunity and use the season as a chance to really talk about Ukrainian culture in UK. And we've had about 40 events um, over the course of uh, yeah, almost a year now. Um, we like to say from Caithness in the north of Scotland to Cornwall, we've covered really every, every part of the UK. Um, we're really proud of that. And it has been entirely cross-sectoral. Um, so that, you know, the, the original, the original um, theme of the season, ironically, was under the title, The Future Reimagined. And that's something we had come up with, talking about the future of Ukraine, the future of Ukraine's important role in the world, its connection to Europe, its connection to the UK. Little did we know that, you know, in a way how all the more resonant that, that theme would be. Um, we also talked about whether, you know, was it right to be doing the season um, given, given the war, given the full-scale invasion? Was this the right chance, was this the right time to do it? Um, but actually what we, I think we, we absolutely believed in it more than ever, that it was a, a vital opportunity to, to talk about Ukrainian culture and, and build those connections. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, so many highlights that we could talk about. I, I, I think we'll probably do a bit of double-hander as we go, but just to set the context a little bit, that was the, the starting point for the season and, and a little bit of what it's looked like. Fantastic, thank you. We, we spoke about how it had to change, obviously, because of the invasion. Tatiana, could you tell us a bit more about um, uh, the planning and uh, for, for those of you that come from cultural institutes, from embassies that might be interested in the ins and outs of the organization, how was the format adjusted? How were the topics changed? Um, all of that obviously had to be happening at 
the very short notice in, in the most difficult of circumstances with you yourself and the rest of the team uh, displaced um, at the beginning of the war um, must have been very challenging. Well, um, paradoxically, we had to change everything, but eventually it's worked out the way we wanted it to work out. So, um, yeah, uh, originally we planned to have almost equally um, the number of events in Ukraine as well in the UK, and we could not do anything in Ukraine basically, except for maybe one or two small, small events, which were ba mostly online uh, with some of the participants on site in Ukraine. Um, but uh, it gave us an opportunity to do much more in the UK. So in this case, it was much uh, larger exposure of Ukrainian culture here. And uh, I think the interest was uh, the highest uh, we could expect. We, we actually, uh, I think, doubled the number of the events we were planning to do because there was so much demand and interest to, to do something. So we just had to respond to that demand and uh, try to do as much as we could within this uh, frame. Well, at first, uh, we had a doubt whether we can and whether we should continue. So we definitely had to postpone everything for the first month. We didn't start the initial project, uh, the promo promotion of it in March as we planned, and uh, the start of it in May as we wanted. We had to postpone it for a few months because literally physically people who were engaged in managing the season and participating, they had to take some time to get to safe places, to bring their kids to safe places, as myself. And we couldn't work, could not deliver what we um, wanted to because uh, there was some time to find a different country, a different home, a different place to work, first of all. Um, some of the participants so some of the participants joined the armed forces and we had to adjust our programs for them to be able to join online from the trenches. And, um, you know, that kind of changes the perspective totally. And, uh, of course, the focus and the, of all the topics was around, mainly around the war. Uh, so we adjusted a lot of the topics, but we remained dedicated to the main topic, topic future reimagine, because we're, we're still dedicated to think uh, about uh, the future after our victory and uh, future development of, of cultural cooperation between the countries. Fantastic, thank you. And um, as this is coming to an end, there's a new fantastic <laughs> manifestation of uh, Ukrainian um, and British um, collaboration partnership um, and in terms of culture, which is the Eurovision uh, Song Contest. Um, so <laughs> looking forward to that. Culture and the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> go, go ahead. Popular culture. Popular culture. <laughs> um, so, so how does it fit within that framework of um, cultural partnership between the two nations? Because uh, obviously it is a platform to promote Britain. It's happening in Liverpool. It is also a platform to uh, for Ukraine because it's. Um, Britain is hosting it on behalf of Ukraine, because Ukraine won last year. But at the same time, it's meant to be a fair competition between many nations taking part. How do you square that circle? Well, we should, we should both answer this in a way, really, mm -hmm. shouldn't we? Because it, our different Three perspectives. Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and with, you know, but I mean, I think that it, it's a, it offers a unique opportunity, doesn't it? Because it's not very often that a major global event like Eurovision has had to be hosted on someone else's behalf. And actually, usefully, because that doesn't happen very often, and thankfully, because it doesn't happen very often, it, it, it gives you a new kind of challenge. Um, because with the mega event, usually it is an exercise in self-obsession. You know, why would, why would you be investing in this thing if you were not going to spend the entire party talking about yourself? Whereas we want to have many conversations this time. You've also got this, and I you know, make a joke of it, but it's important. It is a piece of mass market entertainment. It is Saturday night, you know, shiny floor television. It has massive young audiences, really diverse audiences, the kind of audiences that, that the arts, you know, would, would love to go after in a way. Um, 160 million people watching the final, 96% share in some parts of Scandinavia, right? I mean, the, the, these are extraordinary numbers, right? So all of this is just unique. And to a certain extent, the first thing we do is we, we find our way. You know, 
it's, you don't want to just shift a model of working together onto something like that. You've got to find it, right? The good thing is that the thing is big enough that there's very little either or in there. It's, you can do a lot as well as everything you want to say. And you can promote the UK. You can talk about Liverpool. You can talk about Ukraine. And you can also talk about what happens when all of those things come together through music. And like you say, you know, like other major events, particularly sport ones, there are rules. And at the basis of this is a fair competition amongst 37 countries, which with a prize that is worth winning because the economic benefit of staging Eurovision is actually still very high. You know, its input does, does, does Do outweigh you call that. that quantify? Because at Brand Finance, we were about <laughs> quantifying the value of the ephemeral, if you like. Well, I, yeah, I think so. But, you know, you'll never get away from the... Tr but, by qualifying something for by, by, by quids, right? Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we want to talk about all the softer stuff as well. In, in this context, again, because you're looking at a very definitive article that, that, that can be quantified. But, you know, I'm, I'm interested to hear your reaction to the same question, really. Ah, well, it's, uh, um, I think uh, we have several um, kind of internal jokes about it, that uh, there is, uh, the whole world becomes Ukraine in the last year because of so many people from Ukraine fleeing the, the invasion end up being somewhere and they immediately start, you know, doing some cultural projects everywhere and speaking about Ukraine and involving local inf institutions and audiences. So basically, this, this works as a... a um, a, a global um, network, a global network of Ukrainian cultural um, out exposure. And I think Eurovision, which I have to remind is the third time um, <laughs> uh, topped, uh, leaders by Ukrainian singers. We can <laughs> sing, as you can, you can see. We, 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 that this is something we know how to do, and uh, we are very happy that um, we are able to uh, to present this skill to the world. And I think it's a very um, lucky coincidence for us that it's the UK, since, you know, um, UK has been such a great support for Ukraine. And uh, actually, one of the things we didn't mention is that the season is also part of the strategic partnership between the UK and Ukraine that started two years ago and is continuing. So I think it's kind of uh, a lucky coincidence that amplifies all the effort so far. Absolutely, and uh, well, we, you mentioned the exposure that Ukraine and the whole world becoming Ukraine, and uh, what we're seeing in our Global Soft Power Index this year is that Ukraine's familiarity across the world has risen um, in, in an incredible way from 47th rank last year to 15th in the world this year. Um, that many people have said they know Ukraine at least a little, and obviously they've learned about Ukraine in, in the most difficult of circumstances. Uh, of Russian invasion. Uh, but at the same time, it, it does present um, a platform um, to, to talk about Ukraine and to, to let people know about what Ukraine is about. And, and seeing uh, pictures of Ukrainians and also um, in, in, in fighting, um, demonstrating that strong spirit that, that your nation has, but also um, the refugees around, around Europe and elsewhere becoming ambassadors to an extent for the country. Um, well, that, that puts cultural diplomacy as well in a completely new context, or country promotion, I suppose, in a completely new context. It, it also becomes uh, quite quite difficult to to know how to put the accents. I mean, even now, sort of, um, when I'm introducing this topic, I'm I'm sort of trying to figure out when to bite myself in the tongue because obviously um, we're talking about a, a dramatic and traumatic situation of of an invasion and and a war where people are dying as we speak. And at the same time, well, life goes on and, and we have our jobs and, and yours is cultural promotion. How, how do you put the accents? How do you talk about all that in a way that is sensitive, uh, but at the same time isn't fake? And, and also, how do you um, make sure that not all the messaging is about the war and about um, drama and, and death? Because obviously it's very easy to fall into that trap as well. Um, this war hasn't started on the 24th of February. It started in 2014, so it's been on for nine years now. And uh, as for Ukrainian Institute, the institution was established during the war. So 
this was something you know, basic for us, the foundation of our work from the very beginning, and maybe one of the reasons that the institution actually was uh, brought to life, because we needed this voice out, we needed to be heard, and culture is one of the most in important tools of establishing this conversation and dialogue and making your voice heard. Um, we definitely don't want the world to just know uh, us by this war. Uh, because there is so much more about Ukraine, and Ukraine has so much more to offer and give to the world. And we have already given, actually, and you have heard uh, the First Lady today um, reminding that the Carol of the Bells, the famous Christmas Carol, comes from Ukraine. And it actually came from Ukraine a hundred of years ago as actually a similar mission to tell the world that there is a new Ukrainian National Republic established, and we need the world to see us, to support us. Yeah, but this vo voice was unfortunately not heard loud enough a hundred years ago. But this time we are intended, you know, to be heard and to uh, to, to to get the victory. Um, so it is difficult to speak about the war, but not speak about the war all the time, and not only the war. So we definitely balance, and we try to. Um, remember, yeah, and give this context of why this war is happening, you know, why, uh, what is the essence of this war? It's not uh, something that the world might think about it. It's not a, a war between two countries that can, you know, just uh, have a dispute over something. It's the neo-colonial war of the Russian Empire, which wants to reestablish itself over another sovereign Ukra European state. Uh, we have been um, struggling with this imperial aggression for decades, for hundreds of years. And we know what linguacid means by practice, because Ukrainian language was suppressed for hundreds of years. And it's very, um, it's the resistance of our culture, actually, that we were able, despite of all these unlucky and tragic situations and obstacles, uh, keep our culture and, lang and language alive and uh, um, vivid and uh, continue uh, developing it. And even now, since the one year of the full-scale invasion, the cultural life in Ukraine exists. It continues. You know, we can still win the Eurovision in the middle of the invasion. <laughs> we can still conduct the season in the UK, thanks to the support and with the partners. But still, you know, we are active part of this, and we are also partner of this event, you know, kind of given the Ukrainian component, given the Ukrainian voice to this platform as well. So uh, I think this culture is definitely part of our um, uh, strategy of resistance. It's definitely one of, our, uh, of the battles that we are fighting in and uh, uh, exposing it outside and uh, actually uh, including it in the global conversation is crucial for us. It's, it's not just a matter of soft, software points in the index, it's the matter of the survival for our, our own nation. And that's coming back to what the uh, First Lady and the Minister were also talking about, about how soft power plays a hugely important role in this hard power war effectively. Can I, can I add something yeah, to that, actually? Um, I mean, I remember the opening at Sheffield Dog Fest. We, uh, and the First Lady spoke earlier. She gave a, a message as well for the opening of the season, and she said that every sound of music, every frame of film, uh, it's the cultural front, front that fights chaos. And, and I think, you know, we have stuck with that message that it's really important to keep, the, you know, this cultural program going, even if it doesn't feel you know, in, I suppose, instinctive at times. And I would say that sort of everything that I've worked with Ukraine for really actively for five years, but a bit longer for sort of 10 years. And I think everything you've seen of Ukraine from a soft, cult, from a soft power perspective around the, the inventiveness, the resistance, the resilience, uh, the push for democracy and anti-corruption, humor, um, uh, the memes, the babushka, throw, you know, getting the drone out the sky with the, the jar of pickles. It is actually part of Ukrainian character, which I, I certainly have observed and, and worked with, and, the, and a growth of the cultural sector sort of alongside that. So when we looked at the season, it was also about building on this story of what Ukraine has been building in terms of its arts and creative industries. 
you know, particularly since 2014, um, and, and that identity of Ukraine through arts and culture, and that's why we felt it was really vital to still, you know, to do this work through the season. Fantastic. And um, I suppose if, if you were to do that culture, a season of culture, you know, even before the full-scale invasion started, I imagine you, you would have been targeting a very narrow audience when knowledge of Ukraine, you know, a few years ago even, wasn't really yeah. that commonplace. <laughs> Whereas now, Ukraine is... Uh, well, I don't want to say a household name, but everybody knows about what's happening there, and it's it's part and parcel of um, everyday conversation. So, did you did you see many more people interested in in the events that you were doing as a result of the war, and and um, has has that sort of opened up new doors for Ukrainian culture and an understanding of Ukraine? I mean, my personal view, quickly, yes, definitely. I mean, I for the wrong reasons, as you say, but yeah. it has had a positive impact. I mean, we saw some artists or arts organizations who hadn't been particularly interested in working with Ukraine before who suddenly were interested and saw the opportunity. So we have to see that as a positive byproduct of, of there being increased interest and understanding. Um, as you say, it's, it's kind of crazy really when you know you think about Eurovision as example. We ha there have been several winners from Ukraine <laughs> for the last, quite recently as well. Um, but yeah, Ukrainian culture has been less known than perhaps some other, you know, even in the region I work, um, you know, some, some other, uh, other countries. And so it has, it has been a positive opportunity um, for all the, all the worst reasons. <laughs> and, and Eurovision is now uh, the next step sort of on that journey from, from high culture to popular culture, as we've established. Um, and um, the focus on the audience there is obviously much broader than that of many of the events during the uh, culture season. Um, does that open both Ukraine and Britain to uh, and to, to talk? Is that a platform to talk about things beyond just culture? And is um, how does that sort of nature of Eurovision, as 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 you um, you often talk about it being Eurovision being a broad church, being a, a, a platform for all, how does that come together in that space? Well, like I said earlier, I think it gives you some other opportunities because you can look at things broader. I think you know. The basis, one of the basis of the conflict is to remind people that this is a sovereign country with, with great culture that, that is under an attempt to assume it. And actually, therefore, of course, that cultural element becomes even more powerful because we are reminded of the specificity of it, yes? And um, so we've got an opportunity to bring that to a really wide audience. And so that's why, you know, bringing Kalush back to remind ourselves of the great music, great song. But even, you know, the, 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 the Ukrainian designer who just costumed Sam Smith in his last video, you know, things like that, you know, this great talent. Um, within the context of that wider show, and also, I think you can say anything if you do it with integrity. And so what I, I was really keen about from the beginning was we weren't going to shop window this relationship with Ukraine. It had to be very real. So we've got... Ukrainian creatives working behind the camera and on the camera. So even our brand to begin with was done between two brand agencies, one in the UK, one in one in Ukraine. Uh, a lot of the music that we're using sort of behind the scenes or as bed has been written by some Ukrainian producers. And yes, then we've got some great artists and acts on stage as well in the bits that we wrap around the contest. You've then got the wider angle of Eurovision, and this is why it's also great, because while we have to protect uh, the neutral space of a fair competition on the broadcast, you've got this amazing two-week cultural festival that Liverpool, Liverpool are putting on around it, where you can get into some much more crunchy conversations than you can on a Saturday night pre-watershed television program, right? Um, and then it you know, ripples out. So I hope we're doing the right thing all over the place. The only barometer we have is because we're working so closely with Ukrainian artists. We did meet, this, this thing you were saying about, you know, we, we, when we started our journey, we were tying ourselves up in knots because, you know, quite frankly, there I am sitting with people who are currently going through a war talking about the Eurovision Bloody Song Contest. It made no sense whatsoever. And first of all, you realize, actually, this is a beloved thing by Ukraine. First year you won it was our first year that we got no points. Not saying, <laughs> not saying these two not things are related. Are related. <laughs> um, but I remember one of our first conversations with a, with a senior uh, politician from Ukraine, and we were sort of being very serious about it. And, he, and within five minutes, he stopped us and went, can you just, uh, will you lot just lighten up, please? 
He said, it's the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> you know, you, we came first, you came second. We all have, we all have reason to celebrate, you know. <laughs> and and it, was, it was a moment I won't forget because it, what we were being given was permission to explore this from a hopeful point of view. And we really needed that. Fantastic. And you mentioned Liverpool, and it is the perfect setting for it. It's a port city, a city of immigrants, an open city. Mm -hmm. Twinned uh, with Odessa. Twinned with Odessa. Uh, we're talking a lot about um, nation brands here and their soft power, but um, this is just a perfect setting and a perfect city branding sort of coincidence that this is happening in Liverpool. Or maybe it isn't a coincidence. It is. Well, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, there was a good bidding process in Liverpool 1, but, but part of the reason, you know, Liverpool is our, really, the UK's international brand music city. So, so the UK, UK Liverpool thing is interlinked, I think, but it, but it is a, a perfect setting for it as a port, as a welcoming city, um, as, frankly, a city that just knows how to party as well, and, it, and it's run at it. But also, if you're looking at it from that point of view, it's been a while since Liverpool had a thing, you know, it's a while since Liverpool Europe was European capital of culture. It sat there and watched other cities have their moments and it was probably, it's time again. Also, sadly, you know, I think Liverpool is probably, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, reliance on leisure and culture is one of the largest in the UK. And so through COVID, it was absolutely screwed. And so this is when, again, the mega event becomes quite useful because it's a shot in the arm and a reminder that Liverpool is there and, and is a fantastic place to go. So, you know, it, hopefully if we get it right, and, you know, we'll only know in about <laughs> eight weeks' time, um, everyone will have got what they wanted out of it and also some long-term relationships with the May being made creatively. Um, and I also hope that... 160 million people would have been reminded about why sovereignty is worth protecting because culture and creativity is worth protecting. Absolutely. I mean, Liverpool is a fantastic place. And actually, speaking of COVID, I went there for a holiday. Um, once the restrictions were lifted, not like um, some of the um, prime minister's Can aides just, at the time. Can I just jump in here? Because uh, you just rem spoke that Liverpool uh, knows how to party. And... <laughs> um, this might be a surprise to the majority of people, but despite the invasion, there are still rave parties in Ukraine. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this was something extraordinary before the invasion started because Kyiv was called somehow a new Berlin or something because people from all over Europe would come to have a, their Friday night rave party in Kyiv. And after several months of curfew, people come back to rave parties. And <laughs> you know, they did their Eurovision choice song contest show live from a from from the tube station and we're doing a big ukrainian rave in um in liverpool as well i'm pleased to say so rave on <laughs> yep. we're, we're nearly out of time but as people are coming in i think we can speak for a few more minutes um so please do feel free to uh, take your seats ahead of the next session uh, as we as we finish ours um I also wanted to ask you, it's a big topic, we talk about promoting uh, Ukraine, but the, the other side of the past year, we've seen a lot of um, uh, controversy around Russian culture being promoted at the same time. Um, and we have, culture, we have sanctions on the Russian economy, there are uh, political sanctions against Russia. Should there be cultural sanctions against Russia? And, and what's your point of view? And I'm, I imagine there'll be a different point of view across the panel on that. Well, I have um, a point of view here and a lot to say because one of the things that we were involved in is uh, um, persuading actually the world to postpone or to suspend cooperation with Russia. And we partially were successful in that, but I think still the world is, is not aware enough that culture is not always a good thing. Uh, at least it's not used as a good thing by Russia. And we conducted the survey at the beginning of the invasion on how Russia misuses its cultural diplomacy and how it, um, through the network of institutions that seem to be, uh, you know, implementing cultural project, actually influences other countries, other governments, and can cause big political or other type of problems. And I don't think the world is still aware of this enough. And I think it's our responsibility to remind and to, the war, to warn the world about this danger. Because we were not aware of this um, 
what, nine years ago, 10 years ago, according to the sociological data, 90% of Ukrainians had a good perception of Russia. 90%. And you know what followed it. So be careful, be aware that after Russian culture, Russian tanks show up. And unfortunately, I have to say that, you know, seeing how um, in the center of London, let's say South Bank Center has half of its cultural program around Russian music, I feel very upset because for me it looks like Russian dance on Ukrainian bones in the center of London and, um, you know, just lighting the building on blue and with blue and yellow colors will not do the job and will not help. Claire? Um, yeah, I think Ukrainian voice is the most important one here, but of the British Council, obviously, we've talked about this before, our, our, you know, we're partner institutions, but we do take different perspectives. I mean, we believe in people-to-people -people relationships, so at some point, you know, we need to look at a different way of how you do engage with Russia. Um, currently, though, activities are on hold, and actually the Russian government makes it very difficult to do anything in Russia at the moment. So the types of programs we used to run, we're not able to, and we, we aren't at the moment. Um, and actually, I think our relationship and the dis kind of conversations we've had have definitely, you know, made us also reflect on different ways that that will have to look in future. Um, that it's, it's going to have to be a very different style of cultural relations because obviously there are limitations to, you know, to, to what impact kind of traditional approaches have had and can have. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, you know, the, the, there was an active cultural relationship despite political differences and that isn't possible at the moment and that relationship has been put back however many years and, and you know, we're learning too as an organisation about how we would approach that in future. And Eurovision, in a way, um, has put a ban on, on, on a Russian um, entry into the competitions. Yeah, I mean, I should, I should say that, you know, the, the, the EBU runs Eurovision yeah. centrally and it has decided that uh, Russia and Belarus have no place in the EBU and therefore cannot participate in the Eurovision Song Contest, something the IOC might want to have a look at. Um, but I think, I mean, look, all I say, because I think yours is the the voice here but you know I think there is rightly a big iron door a big black and white response that happens at the start of something terrible that then hopefully can be nuanced out no one's going to argue that pussy riot shouldn't be on a stage singing somewhere I wouldn't argue rather so I think maybe over time it's something that can be nuanced but it's important that we have really strong voices reminding us and I'm really grateful for the advice that we've had from Ukrainian colleagues as we've stepped through putting Eurovision together because it is surprising how many things go back to Russia and we've been really sympathetic to that. So I'm really grateful and, 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 and I've learned so much. And Daniel mentioned earlier about um, the war being a neo-colonial one and uh, the Russian approach being about appropriating Russian culture over the years. And um, obviously we're seeing now Russian culture promoted again and, uh, and, and sort of many of those um, many of those practices, I imagine, happening again. I mean, can you just enlighten us a bit more? Uh, you've done a lot of research on uh, Kazimir Malevich, and, and he's definitely a, a good example of, of that sort of trend, isn't he? Uh, well, yeah, if we speak how this is, um, you know, how, how this is seen from the Western perspective of where we are now, I mean, um, the world has seen uh, Ukraine and the majority of our region through the Moscow eyes for too long. and. I don't know, just go to any museum, go to Tate Modern and ask them, you know, who were Kazimir Malevich or uh, Zheminsky or Katarzyna Kobro or Alexandra Ekster, and they will tell you they were all Russian, you know, despite the fact that Malevich and uh, Ekster definitely had the strongest uh, connection to Ukraine and Zheminsky and Kobro were definitely Polish, you know. But this um, um, tendency, this appropriation, uh, lives much longer than, um, you know, um, contemporary news lines. So if the museum or academic um, uh, community has accepted certain patterns, certain views on, on a topic, it's very difficult and it takes a long time to change that. And, um, but we have to do it as we have to decolonize the museums as we, you know, the, uh, the UK is doing a great job decolonizing its own past we have to also decolonize the Russian imperial past 
and yes, culture is definitely part of that. And we have the right to um, to call our culture Ukrainian, you know, because uh, and uh, even if it was the times when we were part, let's say, of different empires, the Ukrainian identity, the Ukrainian culture was there, and we can relate to that. We can call it, and we can build this connection, this um, um, relationship to, to, to it, its presence. Because thanks to Ukrainian culture, we were able to fight for our sovereignty. And on that note, we'll finish today's panel. Thank you so much for taking part. Thank you all for coming. I'll hand over to uh, Richard Haig, who's hosting the next session on the relationship between corporate brands and nation brands. Thank you all.